This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. A shocking new Oxfam report finds the world's richest 62 billionaires now own as much wealth as half the world. The Oxfam report is titled An Economy for the One Percent, How Privilege and Power in the Economy Drive Extreme Inequality and How This Can Be Stopped. The report is timed to coincide with the meeting of global elites at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Addressing the forum on Wednesday, Vice President Joe Biden cited Oxfam's findings. As we were flying into Davos this week, the Oxfam report uh, made a lot of headlines. It pointed out that 62 of the wealthiest people in the world, and I'm sure they're all good people, have as much wealth as the poorest 3.6 billion people in the world combined. If you read past the headline, the report explains that inequity is driven in large part due to tax avoidance and tax shelters. It's not just about tax equity. It's about economic growth. I don't have to tell Christine this. I don't want to—she is no part of my speech. I don't want to implicate her in that regard. It's not just Joe Biden saying this. The IMF saying this. It's Standard & Poor's, not liberal think tanks in the United States of America. Both say growing inequity is a threat to economic growth. She may not like, like hearing it, but keeping billions of dollars in offshore tax havens might be good for your shareholders, but it robs your home country. So bring it back. Invest it in the communities in which you live, the enterprises, the communities that allow your enterprise to thrive. For more, we're joined by Ray Oppenheiser, who's president of Oxfam America. Again, the report they've just put out that Joe Biden was citing, the vice president gave the opening plenary at the World Economic Forum, the gathering of the world elite in Davos, Switzerland. The Oxfam report is called An Economy for the One Percent, How Privilege and Power in the Economy Drive Extreme Inequality and How This Can Be Stopped. We're going to part two of our conversation, Raymond Oppenheiser. What is most important? for people to understand. We ended part one, where you said uh, more than two-thirds of that 62 people who have more wealth than half the world's population are from here in the United States. How has that gotten? How have they, how have they achieved the, this value? Well, I mean, many of these individuals are people who um, have been in the tech sector. Many of them we know, their first name, on a, you know, almost on a first name basis. Um, and others, many others, actually, one out of five of them are actually from the financial sector, which is a sector that has benefited dramatically from the kind of tax um, loopholes and other, um, other sort of regulatory and, uh, or deregulation processes that have actually enabled this, this uh, accumulation of wealth and concentration of wealth and to happen. And, of course, happen. they pour fortunes into lobbying for those loopholes. Right. Actually, that's, this is what we've seen over the last 20 or 30 years. We've seen sort of a dismantling of the economic system in a, in a way that has produced the kind of volatility that produced the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, which bankrupted many poor families across the United States. But ironically, in the period subsequent, we saved the banking sector. Um, it's been making record profits. There's been an enormous amount of accumulation and concentration of wealth at the top end post the, the financial crisis. Meanwhile, while Main Street has not necessarily benefited. Well, what are, how do you respond to the arguments made by some that these ultra-wealthy people, like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, in fact, do a great deal uh, for the poor, not just here in the United States, but globally? Well, I think all good credit to them for the work they do through philanthropy. But actually, I, you know, Martin Luther King has a wonderful quote about philanthropy, which basically, in, in sort of, in, if I can paraphrase, basically says, you know, we should encourage philanthropy, but we, we cannot, but even while encouraging it, we should remember what the reasons are that it exists in the first place and what the problems are that it's seeking to solve. And I think the, that's the essence of sort of, I think, the question that we're raising here is, fundamentally, what we're talking about here is a rigged system that lacks transparency and in which there's all kinds of opportunities for abuse. Um, tax evasion and tax avoidance that actually is undermining, I think, a number of things, democracy in the United States and around the world, 
um, the social cohesion and social contract that hold countries together. Um, and even, I think, most importantly, I think for your listeners here in the United States, social mobility. I mean, the basis of the American dream is social mobility. And it's interesting to note that the United, most Americans would presume, and if we polled them, I think they would agree to this, that we're number one in the world in social mobility. That's why people come here. By all statistical research, by, you know, reputable institutions, we fall into 19th in terms of social mobility globally. And there's many— And that wasn't always the case. That was not the case. And this is a consequence of what we're seeing now, where the, the rules are rigged, and it's much harder for people that are working two and three jobs in this country to make even a, 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 a poverty wage age, let alone sort of, you know, enable their children to um, get out of the sort of cycle of poverty that they live within. Talk about the tax havens, um, how they enable this, but also specifically where they are. Well, you'll find tax havens, you know, in islands across the Caribbean. You tend to, tend to find them in these very small states that really don't have much other basis for, ec you know, ec uh, an economy any, of any serious stature. So, I mean, one, one rather profound example is um, the British Virgin Islands. There are 24,000 people that live in the British Virgin Islands, and there are 800,000 shell companies there that actually are servicing corporations from for, uh, throughout the world, enabling them to put offshore their, their profits and put them in the British Virgin Islands. And then you have a whole massive number of international banks. There's some 50 banks that are the kind of the transaction agents for all this money moving around the world to tax havens. And if you sort of look at the profits that they're achieving through this, this, this uh, in managing all that money, they're astronomical over the last number of years. And so, you sort of have a system now where the policies of major countries allow these loopholes to exist and allow the tax havens to exist, and then you have a banking system that's found it very profitable to engage in this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, uh, enterprise. Well, I want to turn to a clip from a recent documentary called The Price We Pay. The film tackles the issue of tax havens and their cost to the societies losing out on the trillions of dollars in revenue. This clip is from a parliamentary hearing in England in 2012, where Labour MP Chuka Harrison Umuna questions Barclays CEO Bob Diamond about his company's tax practices. Would you say that one of the ways companies meet their obligations to society is through the payment of tax, yes or no? I think uh, payment of tax is an important responsibility of businesses, yes. Could you tell me how many subsidiary companies your group uses and are incorporated in the Isle of Man? I don't have that number with me. I'd be happy to look into it. And well, according back. to the return that your group company put in last year, you have 30 subsidiaries operating in that jurisdiction. Can you tell me how many subsidiary companies you have operating in Jersey? Uh, I don't have that number with me either. The number is 38. Can you tell me how many subsidiary companies of your group are incorporated and operating in the Cayman Islands? Same answer. You have 181. Now, of course, all of these are well-known tax havens, which are used by companies, and a cursory reading of your group return shows that you have over 300 such companies operating in tax haven jurisdictions around the world. You will understand, Mr. Diamond, that there's obviously, I mean, if you look at the facts I've just presented, that would suggest that your bank is engaged on tax avoidance on a grand scale, would it not? Well, I don't know what you would. I think tax evasion is a very clear phrase, and it's a space we would never I know, go to. And I didn't use the and word. And I, I chose the word tax efficiency, which is our obligation, and it's something that is in line with government policy. But your efficiency may be our avoidance. <laughs> That's a clip from a, a parliamentary hearing in England in 2012, where Labour MP Chuka Harrison Omuna questioned Barclays CEO Bob Diamond about his company's tax practices. I want to turn to another clip from the film The Price We Pay. This again in Britain. Labour MPs are questioning Amazon's director of public policy, Andrew Sissel. The clip begins with Austin Mitchell questioning Sissel, then Labour MP Margaret Hodge speaks. I'm interested in why you pay so little tax, corporation tax particularly, uh, in this country so that we can pay some kind of benefit to all the booksellers you've put out of business, because undoubtedly you've put a large number of booksellers, some of them local in my case, uh, out of business. And I don't get, frankly, from all this uh, interview, why Luxembourg is so lucky. I mean, the books are here, the warehouses are here, the billing is here, the business is here, the customers are here. We have paid uh, in excess of 100 million uh, in payroll taxes uh, in the last, last five years. 
We've paid uh, tens of millions in business rates uh, in the past five years. And I've heard this argument before. Let me just kill this argument because it really makes me cross. On the one hand, so does every other business. So the community-based uh, bookshop that you're putting out of business also pays business rates, also pays its PAYE, also pays V. Actually, probably pays VAT in a way that you don't, and and uh, you in the same way, and you're making it uncompetitive. And the other thing is you depend on the services that come out of the tax you pay. So, you know, you depend on the ability of your uh, of, of, of getting your goods around, so you've got to get the truck, the roads in place, you depend on all those things. And probably worst of all, both you and Mr. Alsted employ people on probably minimum wage, if we're lucky, and then we, the taxpayer, pick up the tax credit bill for that too. So we're putting a lot of money back into the people you, you, you put, and you're not putting enough tax into our economy. That's what's riding us all. That was Labour MP Margaret Hodge uh, questioning Amazon's Andrew Cecil. Uh, Raymond Offenheiser, could you respond uh, to how Amazon and Barclays representatives uh, defended their company's practices? Well, I think what we have, are seeing, I think, uh, in that particular conversation is um, basically a logic in which you know the company executives feel under pressure to share for, to shareholders to deliver more value in terms of shareholder return. And that pressure is relentless, and it's measured quarterly. And I think this sort of crazy logic of, you know, more shareholder, more shareholder value, you know, everything for the shareholder, loses sight of the whole question of what's the public good obligation of any company in its home jurisdiction. And I think that the globalization process that I think we're living today actually has disconnected companies' sense of responsibility to their to the public that they actually should be serving. And so we basically expatriate all this value and then we we tax some minimal amount in our home countries and meanwhile these same companies actually require um, public services, roads, infrastructure, all sorts of things that if they didn't exist their companies would actually suffer, but they want a tax burden of that to be shifted to the individual taxpayer and away from the corporate corporation itself in the name of as the speaker said tax efficiency. We just interviewed Jane Mayer, who wrote the book Dark Money, The Hidden History of the Billionaires Behind the Rise of the Radical Right. And it's about the Koch empire, David and Charles Koch. Um, can you explain how the ultra-wealthy have captured the political process? I mean, this is very significant, given that you found that, what was it, 42 of the 62 of the wealthiest individuals in the world are right here in the United States. Right. Well, I think, I think it's not just the individuals, it's actually the, indus the particular industries themselves through all sorts of um, trade associations in Washington that fund.